feel no way to hide. I've come too far from where I started from. If nobody told me the road would be easy, and I don't believe. God for me this far to leave me. I don't feel no way time. I've come too far from where I started from. And nobody
Praise the Lord. Oh, well, God blessings. Thank, thank you for being with us again on the broadcast. God blessings to all of you. And may his blessings overflow in your life always. We're, we serve the God of the impossible. He can do and he has done more than we could ask or think and he specialized in doing the impossible he declares through his word nothing is impossible for them that believe so let's pray pray with me mighty father thank you for your unmeasurable love your unmeasurable grace your unmeasurable goodness as i stand before your people i pray the aid of your holy spirit all of you and none of me as we go through these scriptures, be it so now, Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. So again, as we continue in this series, we are talking about winning the battle against a angry dragon. Winning the battle against an angry dragon. An angry devil, an angry Satan. Dragon was cast out. And we see it in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. There's a battle that takes place. And verse 8 of chapter 12 of Revelation, he's badly beaten. And heaven rejoices over his expulsion. There's a great warning to those on the earth. We see it in Revelation chapter 12 and 12. The devil has come down having great wrath because he knoweth he has but a short time. The, the loss, the badly beaten loss of the enemy. The enemy who had extreme rank, beauty, Ability, skills, seal us to some and full of wisdom. His pride got in the way, his arrogance got in the way. And he tried to pull off with other angels he had deceived in believing they could, through their arrogance and their pride, thought they could impede or pre prevent something which God was bringing about or manifesting. They thought they could impede it or stop it. The 12th chapter of Revelation starts off with this great mystery in heaven with this woman clothed in the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. She's with the child. And we see the goal of the enemy is to destroy the child as soon as it was born, and the enemy lost that insidious intent on devouring the child as soon as it was born. He was outsmarted. The child was taken up to God and to his throne. He focused his attack upon the woman. And God had provided a way of escape for her. She goes into the wilderness <laughs> for a pointed time, 1,200, three score days. And so now the child get away, the woman get away, this angry devil, there's a war that breaks out in heaven and he loses his place. First of all, the Bible describes it in this way. In Revelation 12 and 7, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels. In verse 8, and they prevailed not, and neither was their place found anymore in heaven. So they're expelled, they're ex they are banished from heaven. Every authority, their citizenship, Whatever they have laid right on, their office, their position, they don't have a job, they don't have a place, they're cast out, lose everything. And worst 
yet is here is these entities in a eternal state is now snatched out of an eternal state placed in a time state they now have an expiration date and a time when you compare what they lost to their existence it is a short time it is a short period when you compare a time span to eternity what is that so here he is come down having great wrath because he knows he has but a short time and we we're going over his goal was to direct the earth so we saw in heaven he lost badly beaten in heaven wow he is he is just literally just and he loses everything and he's cast out as an abominable uh, and as an abominable whatever you want to call it uh, entity just cast out and banished to lose everything third of the angels who rebel thought they could pull this off they too lose their position they lose everything and they're cast out into the earth we hear the angel one of the angel we hear this voice proclaim rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them woe to the inhabitants of the earth for the devil has come down having having and I always I pause at that point great wrath because he knows he has but a long time uh, I mean a short time he knows he has but a short time he comes down having great wrath well he's certainly angry because he lost in the battle He's badly beaten in the, in, in the battle. And so now in this place where he's cast, his goal is to wreck it. And we can see his work has begun to unfold. Yet the unfolding of his work and his anger, his malicious anger, was very much contained. And it was man in his disobedience unleash the containment which held the anger of the enemy and how did he unleash it he unleashed it through his disobedience and it allowed the enemy to come out the world has never been the same since that time we see the love the unmeasurable love of god his unmeasurable grace his unmeasurable goodness to restore man man at this time is Dead. I mean, there is no spiritual connection between him and God, just as the creator of all the universe, just as our heavenly father declared, if you eat of that tree, if you unleash the safety valve, if you remove this secure lid, you will die. It is dangerous. Well, man didn't listen. He did what many would say is the unthinkable. Here in the very garden of God, every amenity man could ever want. Very just all of creation subject to him. God had put man in charge over his handiworks. It's hard for us to conceive the earth in such a heel, in such a hole, in such a uh, a position where all of creation magnify the presence of the universe. All of the plants and animals is in harmony and the goal of the enemy is to wreck this. There's a person that sung a song, a place where the roses never fades. Never a dead plant, never at this the beauty which it flourishes forever and ever all of this was impeded and hijacked by the by man unleashing this door opening this door removing the safety lid eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the world has never never has been the same so we're talking about how do we win if Michael and his angels in heaven fought against the dragon and the dragon fought there in a different arena, a different place, different sphere, and they fought in this arena and the enemy is badly beaten and because he was outdone 
every attempt he made in heaven, he was outdone when it came to impede whatever design which God so purposed, everything he tried to to resist, he was unable to do so to impede anything that God, the creator, was had purpose and design. It is very interesting, the arrogance and the pride of the enemy to even think he could. It is very similar to a picture on the wall arguing with the painter, the artist that paints the picture. I believe it was also another analogy which Jeremiah, he used in the analogy, I believe it's in the 18th chapter of Jeremiah, as he was explaining the potter. He was explaining the potter how he's creating and making this vessel and he were using the analogy the 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 uh, that vessel is totally he it's up to the potter how he designs that vessel and the vessel don't have any say so as how the potter do what it do with it and yet we see how futile the attempt of and this is what pride and arrogance will do the, the futility of some of the dumb decisions will be made by those which will operate in arrogance will cause them to lose everything they have. The deception of the enemy and his ability to deceive, we can see it from the fall of man. It is the results of all the wars we've had from the time of the fall of man. It is the results of brothers against brothers, sisters against sisters, and it has been the results of all the chaos we have had in our world. We understand in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, as we talked about it, Jesus, when the Lord had created all things, he said it was very good. And, and But this stewardship which is given to man had he been diligent in his stewardship all that God created all which was placed under his charge would have been well in harmony and because of re re rebellion because of man didn't listen of course he had some help he had an influencer in the way of his wife, after she had ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, after she pulled the lid off the bottle. He also became a partaker, and the world has never been the same. What we see is the love of God, the mercies of God. His mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generation. And his goal is to restore man. Now, the condition is dire. The, the condition is extreme the goal of the enemy this angry devil his goal is to wreck and to destroy the world Isaiah 59 and 19 reminds us when the enemy comes in like a flood God sets up a standard and I will say from the fall of man God had implemented some guidelines although it is the enemy's major goal, John 10 and 10 states it this way, the thief cometh but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus said, but I've come to give life. I've come that they might have life. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundant. It allows us to really reconnect back to the Father and to operate in the original heritage which God has for us. As you can see, the course of all of our ills was not God's doing, it was man's doing. Man caused all of our ills. Well, he was t totally influenced also. And when we relate, we, we talk about the woman Eve, she was influenced. Influenced by a messenger that would carry a messenger to entice them to operate in rebellion. This is the only area where the enemy has strength is whenever he can trick people into operating in rebellion. It is our dilemma even now. The course of this world 
And what empowers the enemy is whenever we operate in rebellion. And we have seen a world gone mad operating in rebellion. And what do I mean by rebellion? The Bible is the blueprint which lays out all the criteria of how we can be blessed. The Bible lays out the blueprint of all the criteria how we can be overcomers. The Bible lays out all the criteria of how we can have abundant joy, how we can have pledges forevermore, how all the, the peace which he gives us, the, a type of peace which the world do not know, a type of peace despite what we're going through in whatever crisis, we can enjoy a type of peace which is a connection back to the Father. The, the importance in this battle is understanding those basics. If we understand those basics, then our goal is through all diligence is to conform and make the adjustment. And this is why Ephesians 6, it talks about Ephesians 6 and 10 says this. He said, put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. Here is Paul, he's telling us how we can win against an angry devil, how we can win against the angry dragon. It, our protection, our coverage, and our power that God has already invested. Now, granted you, we were already a lost species from the rebellion, but it was God's mercy that I, I use the analogy he extended to us life support. And for a few millennials, we were on life support. Those life supports were in the form of many would call various dispensations. And we see that those life supports, yet there were a day of deliverance coming. There was a day of healing coming. There was a day of breakthrough coming where we no longer have to depend on the life support, but there was a day that's coming that true life will make us alive and reconnect us back to the Father. The era is coming there. It's already prophesied by the prophets. It's talked about in the book of Psalms. It is also written in the law. We hear one of the prophets says, Lo, I believe it was I, that Lo, I come in the volume of the book. All the criteria in the rule, they are placed in the volume of the book of how a time is going to come which will allow us to be removed off of life support. While we're on life support, there are many battles had ensued over the years, over the decades, over centuries and over millennials. A lot of those battles we lost and we lost those battles because of disobedience. Every battle which was lost were lost through disobedience. Every agreement which God had made with man doing those various errors, some of those men's kept their part of the agreements and others did not. And the bulk of those doing that error did not keep their agreement and the outcome was never good. The enemy was able to destroy in their life and wreak havoc in their family. All the hateful and cruel things which happened, the Lord, if man would have operated in obedience, all those things could have been offset. We hear again in chapter 9, I believe, in, of, of, of Psalms, verse 17 talks about every nation which forget God. It's coming down. And every nation which forget God will be cast into hell. So we at a very pivotal point in our life where, where even today, whenever a nation operate in disobedience to the principle of God, it opens the door wide for the destruction of an angry dragon. It opened the door wide for destruction 
of a angry devil and his job is to steal to kill that's what he does he if if the word says salivates if if you could say it it relish it brings him whatever you want to say a euphoria to be able to destroy and just wreak havoc in the lives of little boys and little girls and and in the lives of nations and the lives of people and what gives him that authority what gives him that power as a nation operate in disobedience as a family operates in disobedience as a family operates in disobedience as and so whether it be through ignorance or whether it be through malicious now granted you when a person operate in disobedience through ignorance god allows there's a certain filter in place there's a certain standard which the devil he can still do damage but he can't do as much as he wants to and when a person operate maliciously in disobedience there is the door is wide open and there the restraint there is the, the the limits is removed because of their operating in that level we see the carnage around the world has been caused from people operating nations operating kings operating leaders operating rulers operating in disobedience and there is a principle there is a principle whereas every soul is important in the, in the eyesight of god and every soul who is maliciously mistreated unfairly unjustly god desires justice god desire mercy over judgment and everyone every 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 ill which happens in the world there is an orchestrator behind it there is an angry devil which will deceive others in maliciously treating the ills that we have around this world so as we're talking about this understanding that when we're talking about obedience god has laid out we the bible is the blueprint laid out the guidelines of how we can be in fellowship with him and that fellowship start with a base and that base is love now granted you the creator of all the universe had unmeasurable love because here we were all of our every good act we could ever do was like filthy rags and here i believe it's in the 64th chapter of isaiah talks about it all of our righteousness is is filthy rags but what is it about us in our filthiness that the very god of the universe chose to send it his son send his son i believe revelation talks about it this way chapter 1 verse 5 he who has loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood so it is he that takes these filthy us in these filthy rags and wash us in his blood because of his love and now he's able to present us to the father and we have access and as we operate in obedience to the principles of god and what is that i mean so he made it very clear what those guidelines are and it's it's the basics of it is love there is no greater we're talking about love for our fellow man and love for one another and love for all the things that are that are right and love for and when you love you can't mistreat you can't cheat you can't take advantage of you can't there's so many guidelines there we talk about words that touches that love with hinged upon goodness and faith and gentleness and meekness and patience and all those ingredients which are tied up into and every soul alive is dispensed the same type of should i say interaction and and appreciation and the same type of of connectiveness this is one of the attack of the enemies to make sure that don't happen so the battle is on every nation which forget god and, and why is that when we have a a detest for life what i mean by that and this is where the world is gone now where it has a detest for life and a respective person and and to as we can already see in this this era what we're in and what they have done is perverted the principles of god word and anytime we pervert the principles of god word it gets to a point of blasphemy 
for me where we're turning everything which God says, turning it around backward in any nation that will make a law and pronounce any kind of rule in total opposition of what God decrees and something that God has designed and the purpose of how and the way that he's designed it and any, doesn't matter who leader, what leader, what kind of a leader in their arrogance when they make such laws in rebellion, it opens the door for an angry devil to do major destruction. So this is part of our battle. This is part of our fight. Every soul which come into the knowledge of God and as they begin to learn of him, it is so important. Every Christian which come to know God, first of all, as I like this and I refer to it often is John 15 and 7. If you abide in me, every Christian which come to God, this, this, this is the access. They come through Christ, acknowledging he is the one who died for our sins. And I believe Isaiah 53 made it clear. First of all, he starts off with, who in the world is going to believe this? Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? First of all, if he's saying this, it makes it very interesting because the, the angels desire to look into this. And we see it in Psalms 8. What is man? Uh, here's the creator of all the universe. See, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Angels trying to figure this one out. What is man that thou art mindful of him? So Isaiah, he's saying, who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall come up before them as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness, and we shall look upon him. There is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men's a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it was our face from him. Surely he's borne our grief and carried our sorrow, yet we did esteem him, stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression and he was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. See, all we like sheep that have gone astray and everyone is turned to their own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted. As a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before a shearer is dumb, but yet open as he, not his mouth. Listen, it was this kind of love that God has for us. It's, uh, I hear what the, the, I hear what the psalmist is saying, <laughs> and I hear also, I hear what Isaiah is saying in this chapter, chapter 53. Who, 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 who has believed our report? Who's going to believe this? That the creator of all the universe is 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 doing how how can he love us? How how, how do you measure this? To me, there there is the awesomeness of what it means to be in God's presence and to get some insight, insight of what it is. And every individual who had gotten an uh, opportunity to look somewhat in, and I, I hear Paul say we look through a glass darkly, but every individual who has gotten in the presence of God realize that I, I hear an eyes there, he's going, and, and he's, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips when you come into the presence. You don't even know how, can. his words is not adequate enough to be able to describe the awesomeness of God. So he's going, woe to me, I'm a man of unclean lips, but it also shows the mercy of God and the grace of God and the goodness of God. And here's a person, no doubt, feel like he's doing a good job in the day of, of King Uzziah and so forth and but now when he comes to into the presence of God he can't even articulate he, his words he's unable to put his words together to describe the awesomeness of God all the almighty the creator of all the universe the one who is kings of kings and the one who is lords of lords and he's trying to put it in so he's going woe is me that I'm a man of unclean lips so when you look at this and the love of God and what it is to reach out to us these 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 beans and filthy rags and it doesn't matter all the good that we're trying to do it can't connect us back to God but we see the one who has loved us and has washed us from our sins in his own blood and has given us an opportunity and how we connect now every one of us then have a neutral has a plan we have the opportunity now to reconnect now that we've come into the light all we have to do now is walk in it how do we walk in it 
We walk in it through obedience. And how is this made necessary? It is made necessary by what the Lord Jesus declared unto us. He says, learn of me. He said it in Matthew 11 and 29. Learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now let's say this. When you're in a battle, everything won't be pleasant. Or it may not appear to be pleasant. But let's also explain it like this. There's always, you hear some say, well, the way you, it, it's hard being a Christian. No, it isn't. If hard, if you choose not to learn of him. Because if you choose not to learn of him, there becomes, the more you don't know about the Lord, once you've accepted him, the more you are exposed to the attack of the enemy. So here's what the word says. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Well, if we get many afflictions being righteous, then where do we get where we are not being afflicted? Affliction is painful. So he's saying many are the affliction of the righteous. Then if many are the affliction of the righteous, what other option do I have? Well, I'm glad you asked because the other option you have is to be holy. Listen. When your ways please the Lord, even your enemies don't want to fight with you. They'll go pick on somebody else. Let's pick on somebody we know we can beat. That's the way it is for the enemies. So this word says, if your ways please the Lord, that even your enemies, that's our other option. And Paul is saying it too in his words and how he's saying it. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So when you're in battle... And you're strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And you began to learn of him. See, when we're talking about the difference between righteous and holy. Holy, and I say it again, has been redundant. The way I look at holiness and being holy is not some accolade that you wear so you can have bragging rights for somebody can try to give accolades to your life. But I believe that holy is where you become submersive, where he says, if you abide in me, my word abide in you, where that individual becomes submersive in the word of God. As Jesus said, learn of me. That's that individual that really has a hunger and thirst and really began to learn of him and really began to come to know God in the real. As it stated in Psalm 16 and 11, in his presence is fullness of joy. Is that individual become so submersive in the the word of God to their in full joy and their fullness of joy and at his right hand are pledges from forevermore and there have been those even in the Old Testament who have had a fellowship with God they were submerged in him and I believe the three Hebrew boys in the third chapter of Daniel is just a few of those people who were like that <laughs> they're able in the midst of what others would have been panic and sweating and and feel like it was the end of the world he brought before the king and they say, hey, I, I hear that you didn't bow down. I hear that you, I'm, I'm going to give you another opportunity. I, you didn't worship the image. And these boys going, no, we heard it correctly and we're not doing this. And, of course, the king got extremely mad and his whole vest is changed and nobody don't talk to a king like that. And so he had his powerful, strong men. No doubt the strongest one he could find because he's in such haste and he's so angry. Throw these men and of course, before he do this, he relished in the fact that he's going to heat this flame seven times hotter than it had been a normal flame. When you're holy and you're submersive in the word, you're not affected by the, though the earth be removed, you're not affected by that. Though whatever comes your way, you're not affected by it. You are at the point where nothing will separate you because you've become submersive in the presence, in the presence, in God's presence. There's fullness of joy. Whatever's going around you, you're not moved by that. Though the world be moved, though the, 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 the mountain rents, whatever take place, though there be plagues, though there be, be whatever, wars and rumors, whatever's taking place, you're not moved by that. Though whatever threat that comes upon your life to you when you're in God's presence, not a threat at all. These boys were there. And so we see in this third chapter of Daniel, nope, we're not going to bow down. And the king, in his arrogance, 
he will see <laughs> what kind of God you serve. There ain't no God able to deliver from fire. And, and lo and behold, he is in, think he's losing his mind because he looks and he sees and he called all of his counselors and whoever. It's almost like somebody calling a psychiatrist. Am I losing my mind? I know I threw in three. I see the four. I see four. And one of them looked like the son of God. And so what an, what an insight. And he calls these boys out. And there is no smell of smoke. Now, why am I saying this? There is a place and an opportunity for all of us to put on the full, the whole arm of God. And this is where Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And it says, Put on the whole arm of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles. What do you mean wiles? Trick, scheme, gags, scam job, whatever. Everything that the enemy throws at you, if you have the whole armor on, you, it's resil you, it's, you have a resiliency. You have, you're able to stand through the midst of it. You don't have to think about what you're going to say because when you're in the presence of God, and that's what holiness does, it has more to do with our fellowship than some accolade that somebody will place upon us. And it, it doesn't have so much to do with our title or whatever the position, whether an apostle or a prophet or whatever, just a simple servant of God that loved the Lord that will follow those principles of learning of him and being in his presence. And, and thank God. God for the word. Thank God for the Bible because it's the blueprint that allows us to understand what it is. Now, this is a very beautiful gift given unto us because it allows us to know what God hates and what God, what God lacks and what God, what really brings joy to him. And this is the blueprint. And so thank God for such a gift. How do we win against an angry devil? How do we win against an angry dragon? How do we win against all the forces of, of evil? Paul makes it plain. Put on the whole arm of God. You'll be able to withstand. You'll be able to handle in the fight. Listen, and when you become, when you're able to handle in the fight, the body don't profit any, anything. What do you mean by that when you say the body don't profit anything? In other words, we're not going to make decisions to save our hide. We're going to make decisions that we don't break fellowship with God. We're going to make decisions that we that we're going to stay in the presence of God, in his presence of fullness of joy. So we will make decisions. And this is what Jesus was saying. He says, what do it profit you? If you gain the whole world and you lose your soul. See, your decision become greater and under more duress and under more frustration if you're in Christ, but you haven't have that hunger and thirst for the word and you haven't come to understand who he is. You abide in me and my word abide. In other words, by you abiding in Christ and now you're taking the word in you, the word of Christ, coming to learn of him. This is what sets you apart from the pack. When you, so it's, when you says learn of him, it's not just verbally being able to quote it, but what you've come to know now becomes a part of your life. That is the difference. And I hear people go, well, this is the difference. But whenever you began to take the word and to meditate upon it day and night, the first Psalm says that you'll be like a tree which is planted beside the rivers of waters, which will bring forth its fruit in its season and it leaves all souls shall not wither and whatsoever you do shall prosper. Listen. Paul, as he spent time, as he come to know God in the real, he spent time with him. And he said, I was taken up to the third heaven. And here came to a place where Paul says, he's unable to, he says, it's unlawful. In other words, Paul is trying to get across my vocabulary. I can't put it in words. I, my vocabulary is not rich enough. My, oh, everything that I, he didn't know how to put it in words. He said, it's unlawful. I, I, there's no way I can give justice what I saw. 
It's unlawful. I don't know whether I was in the body or out of the body. It means something to be so much in the presence of God. You don't know about the state, but you also come to understand that the awesomeness of who he is. And I, <laughs> hallelujah. The awesomeness of who he is. And Paul going, it's just unlawful for me. But I, I like how he tried to give us some insight. He says, eyes haven't seen. Ears haven't heard and it haven't entered into the hearts of men. He said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard and it haven't entered into the hearts of men the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But thank you for that one, Paul. He says, but it is revealed. How? We get somewhat of an insight and thank God we only see through a glass darkly. In the spirit we come to see somewhat of an inkling and it's still mind blowing. He says, yet it, he said, but it is revealed by his spirit. Yes. And this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But it is revealed by his spirit. And he says, yea, the spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. Okay. So if it's revealed by his spirit, this is part of the enemy is to make sure then that that's not where you're spending your time. The goal of the enemy then is to make sure that you're not meditating upon God. His law. The, the goal of the enemy then is to make sure that you're not meditating upon the law of God. The goal of the enemy is to make sure that you're not spending your time in the presence of God. The goal of the enemy, this is part of the battle. Because if it's revealed, this insight of the greatness of what God has prepared for us, and Paul can't even put it in terms of words, trying to explain it with his vocabulary, but he's trying to give us insight that it is revealed by the Spirit of God, and yea, the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I see why he says, ears haven't heard, eyes haven't seen, hadn't entered into our hearts. So obviously, as we're talking about how to win, we will continue. We are already out of time, but we'll continue. As, as, uh, look forward to you all joining with me as we continue this journey, talking about winning against an angry devil. God has empowered us to win, and we can win, and we must win. It's already been paid for. He's provided all the tools for us, so let's win. Hallelujah. God bless him. So until next time. Wherever they are on the jobs and the cars, healing come forth now. Deliverance come forth now. Breakthrough come forth now. In the mighty name of Jesus, be made whole from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Be made whole. Hallelujah. Be made whole. The blood of Jesus make thee whole. The blood of Jesus makes thee whole from the crown of your head to the sole of your feet. Be whole in your mind, in your heart, in your soul, and in your spirit. Every shackle be broken now. Every wall come down in your life now. Joy of the Lord come forth. Peace of the Lord come forth. In Jesus' mighty name. And whatever that be, that's a special prayer request. We're standing and we're touching and we're agreeing with those requests now. In Jesus' mighty name. Be it so. Be it so. Be it so. Every wall down. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And those things that we need to pray, the, the things that we don't know how, we pray that the Holy Ghost will intercede in those areas. In Jesus' mighty name. We commit this into the Lord Most High. And it is so. It is so. It is so. Because your eyes is upon the righteous and your ears is open to that cry that whenever the righteous cry, you hear it and you deliver it out of all their troubles. The angel of the Lord encampers round about them that fear him and delivers them. And we thank you, mighty God, because your word declared that to a thousand shall fall at our side and ten thousand at our right hand. It won't come nigh us. We'll see it with our eyes, but it won't happen to us. We thank you. Let, let it be our passion always to be in your secret place. We thank you for the miracles today. Thank you for the healings today. Thank you for the breakthrough today. And even now, as we're touching and agreeing, because your words are not here to touch and agree, you would give it us. We would stand, touch and agree, you would give it us. 
and the evil world we stand up in that world we turn it down in Jesus mighty name and it is so hallelujah it is so glory it is so mighty God thank you thank you for hearing us thank you for breakthrough this day thank you for deliverance this day thank you for change of heart change of mind change of spirit change of soul unmeasurable is your love unmeasurable is your goodness unmeasurable hallelujah thank you mighty father that you love us that much you give us access and it is it is it is your will to give us the kingdom and we thank you for that mighty god thank you hallelujah yes thank you that whenever the righteous call you hear it and deliver us from all that trouble thank you for victory today in jesus mighty name hallelujah and it is so so again Go in peace. Enjoy the blessings of the Lord. He is for you. And it brings some pleasure when God's children operates. When God's children began to utilize those gifts, those ability healing it to children's bread. And it brings God's pleasure whenever we operate upon his word. We take those things that rightfully belongs to us and he's already paid the price for Christ paid the price for it all he was the one that poured out his soul and the death was numbered with the transgressors buried the sins of many and interceded for the transgressors that's the kind of unmeasurable love that Christ has for us and Jesus went poor enough to say evil fathers know how to give good gifts to their kids then how much more would the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. The scriptures stated in Luke 18 and 1 about always to pray and not to pray. And there are times we won't feel like praying. I can attest that some of my greatest breakthroughs and healing was when I didn't feel like praying. And I have to admit that to the Lord, Lord, but here I am. And I don't feel like praying. I really don't even know what to say. I know I love you. And when those words left my tomb, the Holy Spirit interceded and began to pray and began to interact in things that I didn't know how to say. And one of the greatest breakthroughs, normally 10 minutes of prayer and I'm about done, but this was so awesome and beautiful, three and a half later, after I was done praying, I thought I had only prayed 15 minutes, and it's something unique to be in God's presence, and it's available to all of God's children. God has no respect to a person. It is true you draw nigh to him, and he will draw nigh unto you. Be blessed, my brothers and sisters. Whatever you do, continue to stand. When you've done everything, that's what Jesus said it best. In 18 and 1, you ought to always pray. God blessings. Love you. Until next time, go in victory, go in peace, go in love. In Jesus' name, amen.